Hi guys, we've done it for micro, now let's do it for macro. We're gonna look at nine powerful diagrams, amazing diagrams that you should give a little bit of weight to in your revision. Because if you can use these diagrams well in your essay, it's gonna blow the socks off your examiner. They're gonna be so impressed, both if you use them in analysis and in evaluation, these diagrams are absolutely fantastic. Give them weight, know them well, know how to use them well. Here we go with number one. Don't underestimate the value of these diagrams. We are looking at very basic shifts, shifts of AD, shifts of LRAS, but not just the simple shifts. Everybody can do the shifts, that's fine. But the impact on the macro objectives, these diagrams linked to growth, linked to unemployment, linked to inflation, linked to the trade position. You've got to say, why? Why did these things change? For example, if we're shifting AD right, why is there an increase in growth? Why is there a reduction in unemployment? Why is there an increase in demand upon inflation? Why, in theory, is there a worsening of the trade position? No, why? Same for a reverse, for an AD shift left. No, why we see changes in these macro objectives. Same for an LRAS shift right. Why do we see the increase in growth? Why do we see the reduction in unemployment? Why do we see the reduction in cost push inflation? No, why, why, why? For all of your shifts of AD, LRS, all these macro shifts, know the impact on the macro objectives and why. That will really impress your examiner and boost both your analysis and evaluation marks. Number two is your diagram for the natural rate of unemployment. A lot of students don't even know that this diagram exists and it's very powerful. You can use it in two ways. One, obviously to illustrate the natural rate, but the three types of unemployment within it, structural, frictional, seasonal, but also you can use this diagram to show the impact of supply side policies to reduce the natural rate. So here is the diagram. We're in the labor market, demand for labor, but we have two supply curves. We have what we think the supply curve of labor is, so SLF, LF is labor force, and then we have the actual labor supply curve. So the normal labor supply curve is supposed to tell us the quantity of workers willing and able to work at different wage rates. So think of this curve as the willingness to work curve, but then the actual curve, uh, supply curve, tells us the number of workers who actually take jobs. So here we have those who actually take, and here we have those who are willing. We get the equilibrium from where actual supply hits demand, that gives you W1 and QFE, I've called that full employment, that is full employment in the labor market, equivalent to YFE on an AD and AS diagram. But at that wage rate of W1, they are the workers we're taking, but supposedly they are the ones who are willing. The difference between those who are willing and those who actually take is your natural rate of unemployment. Free market economists call this voluntary unemployment. So there's your diagram, you need to be able to link why these guys are supposedly willing, but only these guys take, link that, to both structural and frictional unemployment, seasonal, okay, whatever, but those two are the fundamental ones you link to. So this is your natural rate of unemployment diagram. It's your structural unemployment diagram. It's your frictional unemployment diagram, absolutely. But also, you can show the impact of policies. Successful policies to reduce the natural rate, to reduce structural unemployment, to reduce frictional unemployment, will shift this actual supply curve to the right, towards the labor force supply curve. Powerful diagram, not many students know it exists, but boy, it's gonna score you big marks if you can use it well. And then we have the free trade diagram, another diagram that a lot of students don't even know exists. It's basically your tariff diagram just without a tariff. The difference though is that we have to show the equilibrium price and quantity because that would be the price and quantity without any trade in a closed economy. And then we move from that towards PW, where you've got world supplies with a comparative advantage. This diagram is great because we can link it to the benefits of trade, the idea of allocative efficiency because of comparative advantage exploitation, we can show that. Lower prices and higher consumer surplus, we can show that. Higher quantity, higher choice, we can show that. Higher economic growth because of exports coming in from these guys, we can show that as well. Very powerful in that sense, but we can also see from this diagram, reasons for protectionism, how domestic producers are losing, quantity falling from Q1 to Q2 too. Lower revenues, lower profits to them, but also domestic unemployment linked to that. Labor is a derived demand. So it also gives you a few reasons for protectionism too. Know this diagram well, break it down, lots we can show from it. And then number four, we have the tariff diagram. My God, this is a king diagram. Here it is, 
No doubt you've drawn this many times, but I've also highlighted three areas which are going to be used most likely in essays. These are the three hard-hitting areas that are most likely going to be relevant to back up the points you're going to be writing in your essay. Now, you've got to know this diagram inside out, but you've also got to remember that this diagram links very lovely to reasons for protectionism. This diagram links to infant industry protection, links to protection against dumping, links to protection against unemployment. It links to tariff revenue, government revenue. It links to reducing a trade deficit because imports are squeezed. So use this diagram to back up your reasons for protectionism, but also use this diagram to back up the costs of protectionism, the problems with using protectionism, such as higher prices, lower consumer surplus, deadweight loss of consumer surplus, lower quantity and lower choice, impact on living standards. You can talk about domestic producer inefficiency. Lots of issues on this diagram you can link to when you evaluate protectionism. Very powerful diagram, know it well, that's for sure. And now number five, something that will really impress examiners, and that is showing comparative advantage using a diagram. Now we know how to calculate comparative advantage, and we know that we would use comparative advantage in our essays. For example, if it's an essay on trade patterns between the UK and China, we would say the UK will export services to China because that's our comparative advantage, whereas China will export manufactured goods to the UK because that's their comparative advantage. There'll be trade between countries like that. But we can also show comparative advantage on a diagram. Now we know we use trading PPFs, right, to show comparative advantage. So here we have a UK trading PPF and a China trading PPF. But can you see that I put numbers on the axis? Have numbers ready to show comparative advantage. And then in your essay, you would say that the UK has got the comparative advantage in producing services. Why? Because when they produce one service, they only are giving up three manufactured goods, whereas China produce one, to produce one service have to give up five manufactured goods. Other way around, China have the comparative advantage in goods production. Why? Because to produce one good, they're only giving up a fifth of a service, whereas the UK to produce one good have to give up a third of a service. So that's very useful to put in your essays. Fantastic. And that will really impress the examiner. But also, let's say it's an essay about the benefits of trade and you're talking about comparative advantage exploitation, specialization, allocative efficiency. You can add on a new trading PPF to represent new production possibilities as a result of comparative advantage exploitation. And all you would do is connect the two high numbers on this diagram. And that shows the new trading PPF as long as a suitable exchange rate can be found. So remember, comparative advantage states that countries should specialize in producing goods and services where they have a lower opportunity cost and then trade with another country as long as a suitable exchange rate can be found. If it is found, it means consumption can now take place beyond the respective PPS of both countries. And that's what you're showing here. So there's your new trading PPF. You can see the PPF is beyond the previous PPFs of the two countries. That is the benefit. Greater consumption possibilities as a result of trade, as a result of comparative advantage exploitation. So have that ready. It's going to rock your exam. It's going to impress examiners so much. And now, guys, we're going to look at three awesome diagrams that we can use to evaluate macro policy. Let's start with this one, the Laffer Curve. Great evaluation to fiscal policy. You can use it in two ways. We know this is the Laffer Curve. We have an efficient tax rate of T-star where we can maximize tax revenue. So two ways of using the Laffer Curve. One is to evaluate an increase in, let's say, income tax. An increase in income tax, maybe the government is doing that because they want to improve income distribution and equity. But the problem is if they increase income tax beyond T-star, that's going to reduce tax revenue. Make sure you know why. Laffer Curve illustrates that lovely. But then the other way, so if the government cuts income tax, evaluation is that actually tax revenue can rise. And you would say, why? Using the Laffer Curve. Very powerful diagram to evaluate fiscal policy. More great evaluation of fiscal policy, this time the crowding out effect and a lovely diagram to illustrate it. This is evaluation saying that if expansionary fiscal policy is government spending heavy and that government spending is borrowing fueled, then it can crowd out private sector investment. Why? Because if government spending is borrowing fuel, the government is basically demanding more and more loanable funds, more and more of people's savings when they issue bonds. That's going to increase the demand for loanable funds, increase the demand for people's savings basically and increase equilibrium interest rates. The higher interest rates is going to detract private sector investment and thus crowd out the private sector. We have unbalanced economic growth, an unbalanced economy with too much government activity, not enough private sector activity. Um, that is going to impact on both short run and long term growth and on sustainability of growth going forward in the economy. So very useful diagram to illustrate, very simple diagram, use it well, great evaluation to impress the examiner.
And now an awesome evaluation point to expansionary monetary policy is saying that expansionary monetary policy is useless if the economy is in a liquidity trap. Very, very good argument to use, very high level evaluation point. There is a diagram to illustrate it as well. Very funky diagram. Here's how the argument goes. So there is a point where interest rates hit their lower bound, where interest rates are so low that individuals out there in the economy have already converted all of their financial assets, let's just say bonds, into cash. And it makes sense because if interest rates are so low, why would you tie your money up in financial assets if the return is so poor? You may as well hold liquidity. You may as well hold cash and therefore engage in transactions, spend it. And that's what's going on here. So when interest rates are so low, the demand for money curve, liquidity preference curve becomes flat. And the idea is that individuals at this interest rate have already converted all their financial assets into cash. Hence the curve becomes flat. Then the argument says that if the central bank tries to reduce interest rates further by increasing the money supply, you can see that it won't have any effectiveness. Interest rates can't fall below interest rate one, I1 here, and therefore borrowing will not rise, aggregate demand will not rise, growth will not increase, unemployment will not fall, inflation will not rise. Monetary policy loses its effectiveness completely if the economy is in a liquidity trap, where the demand for money curve, where the liquidity preference curve becomes flat, that is your liquidity trap right there. So you can use this evaluation point. Very useful at the moment because interest rates are pretty much at their lower bound. They're essentially at zero in many developed countries like the Eurozone, like Japan. Even in the UK, you can apply this argument. So great argument to say that expansionary monetary policy is gone. It can't be used Keynesian argument here. Therefore, if we want to stimulate AD, fiscal policy is the only option. And lastly, guys, number nine, great diagrams for development essays, your poverty trap, your poverty cycle diagrams. You can see there are two of them. You have your growth uh, poverty cycle and your development poverty cycle. You can use these to illustrate the barriers to development and how low incomes on its own is a major barrier to development because it basically leads to cyclical poverty. But also you can talk about poor access to education and health as a barrier and how that leads to poverty. Low productivity is a major barrier. A lack of investment, a lack of technology is a major barrier. Lack of savings, a lack of range of financial institutions and banks as a major barrier. So you can link these to a variety of barriers to development and poverty that results um, as a result of that. But also you can link these diagrams to development policies and how development policies could break these poverty cycles. For example, government spending on education and healthcare. For example, FDI coming in and these foreign firms actually training workers, boosting human capital, boosting productivity. You can talk about investment and improvements in technology, uh, improvements in capital, boosting productivity. You can talk about FDI breaking the savings and investment gap, microfinance breaking the savings and investment gap. So also linking development policies to breaking these poverty cycles will be awesome use of diagrams in a development essay. So that covers it guys, nine very, very powerful macro diagrams. Know them well, know how to draw them, know how to use them in both analysis and evaluation. You will smash it, you will impress your examiners so much. Great way to give extra weight to your revision and these key diagrams. Thank you so much for watching guys. Keep pushing hard in your revision. I'll see you all in the next video.